There's something inherently disturbing about toy recalls. I mean, after all, you're dealing with a situation where a plaything, which was intended to, you know, bring joy within children, ended up maiming or traumatizing them for the rest of their lives. With the rise of social media, we've seen more and more instances of these dangerous toys pop up, with concerned parents taking to the web to report disturbing and harrowing encounters with these toys hurting their kids. Some of these reports actually resulting in full-on recalls. From a magic wand toy featuring secret gory imagery to pokeballs causing suffocation in infants, these are the internet's most dangerous toys. Before we get started, I want to thank today's sponsor, Cook Unity. Cook Unity offers batches of gourmet meals prepared by our country's best restaurants and chefs and ships them right to your front door. Each Cook Unity meal is prepared in a regional micro kitchen and is shipped at the peak of freshness. They arrive fresh, never frozen, and all you gotta do is heat them up and they're ready to eat. Cook Unity chefs prepare each dish with real ingredients, nothing artificial, with humanely raised meat and organic ingredients when possible. Cook Unity chefs offer a wide range of meals with over seven different dietary preference filters, including vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. And with that said, let's take a gander at what's on the Wavy Web Surf menu today. First, we got this Mexican-style chorizo breakfast burrito with salsa verde from Chef Dustin Taylor. This hearty burrito is scrumptious, and as a big chorizo guy, I really enjoyed starting the day with this bad boy. Super tasty. Next up, we have our chicken and pearl couscous with mozzarella, arugula, and cherry tomatoes by Chef Andre Mendez. At just 540 calories, this couscous dish packs a punch flavor-wise. Zesty and fresh, a solid pick overall. And last but not least, my personal favorite from the batch, the orange barbecue chicken thighs and pimento mac and cheese with brown sugar baked beans. What do I really have to say, guys? Like, you can see how fire this looks. Everything about this is just absolute chef's kiss, a one-way ticket to Flavortown. The subscription is super flexible and you can pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time. So by now, I know you guys are hungry, so let me hook you up. To get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals, go to cookunity.com slash wavywebsurf and use code wavywebsurf50 at checkout. Nearly 10 years ago, a disturbing story involving a magic wand toy that was purchased from a dollar store began circulating around the internet. The small wand-like trinket seemed innocuous enough, but the toy contained a dark secret, a secret that when revealed opened up one of the most bizarre rabbit holes in internet mystery history. This is the legend of the evil stick. It all begins in early November of 2014, just days after Halloween. In Dayton, Ohio, a woman named Nicole Allen was shopping with her two-year-old daughter at a local dollar store when something on the shelves caught her in her child's eye. It was a pink magic wand toy. The wand, which took the shape of a flower, was secured in packaging that promised kids wonderful music, magic, and fairies. Among these whimsical claims, the packaging also featured an anime character, that character being Sakura Kinimoto from the 90s anime series Cardcaptor Sakura. Despite the presence of this anime character on the wand's packaging, the wand itself had nothing to do with this anime, like it wasn't featured in the show. It almost seemed like the anime character's inclusion was arbitrary to make the product seem more exotic. And easily the strangest part about this toy was the name of it. It was called Evil Stick. It goes without saying that this name is quite a juxtaposition when compared to the product's packaging. Now the mother, Nicole Allen, she didn't notice this weird product name and thinking that her daughter would like this, you know, magic wand toy, she bought it for the two year old. And the kid loved it at first, but several hours into the play session, the true nature of the evil stick would reveal itself. At home, as the child began to play with the evil stick, a haunting cackling laugh began to emit from the small speakers of the device. Naturally, the mom's confused as to why a toy for toddlers would be making such a creepy laugh sound. So she confiscated the toy and investigated it further. And moments later, Nicole would make a harrowing discovery. The woman found that beneath the foil on the flower face of the wand was a bloody demonic witch looking woman brandishing a knife. Yeah, shit's getting real. Upon the discovery, chills ran down the woman's spine as lights and an evil cackle activated during the grisly discovery. <laughs> Now, 
Nicole Allen was in complete shock. I mean, how could something intended for children feature imagery like this and just be haplessly sold at a dollar store without much of a warning? Feeling as if the toy was a potential danger to children in the sense of them being traumatized, Nicole took her evil stick findings to the local media in the hopes of getting help in finding answers to the then unfolding mystery. The first individual questioned about the evil stick, naturally, was the store owner that was selling the stick itself. This individual was a man named Amar Mustafa. When questioned about the evil stick, Mr. Mustafa denied any wrongdoing in selling the toy and defended the item, saying that it was the parent's responsibility to thoroughly inspect toys before giving it to children. Though it appeared as if Mustafa wasn't aware of this particular image being featured in the product. The name on it, it says evil stick. So from the name, I would, ha if I'm buying it for my kid, I would inspect it before I even give it to them. Mr. Mustafa would also reveal that he decided to stock this product after it caught his eye at a retailer's convention. It was at this convention where Mr. Mustafa made a deal and acquired some evil sticks for his inventory. But unfortunately, Mr. Mustafa claimed that he couldn't recall, nor did he have any record of who sold him the collection of evil sticks. Where the f did he buy this from? It's like a gun show, but it's for toys that try traumatize children instead. Whatever the case, for the time being, the origin of the evil stick would remain a mystery. Meanwhile, clips from the local Ohio evil stick story began to go viral across YouTube and Reddit. Occurring at what might have been the peak of creepypasta enthusiasm online, the evil stick story was compelling to those intrigued by macabre mystery, and thousands on the web began discussing the disturbing finding. Around this time, a small YouTuber by the name of Matt Clark would help in the armchair investigation of this strange product by purchasing an evil stick for himself and showcasing it in a YouTube video. <laughs> Clark was a freelance writer in the Dayton, Ohio area and would follow up this video with a longer one in which he detailed everything he had discovered in his researching of the evil children's gizmo. Aside from giving the world a better view at the evil stick itself, Matt Clark also contributed to the evil stick investigation by bringing some new information to the table. That information being that not all evil sticks contained the same image. In fact, there were actually several different images a customer could be surprised with, none of which were as creepy as the witch, but zombies and ghouls were found. However, some evil sticks featured more age-appropriate images like friendly anime characters and angelic-looking beings. And the evil sticks that contained pleasant imagery were said to have played whimsical music like the packaging promised. It's like there were good evil sticks and bad evil sticks that you could get. Matt's videos regarding the evil stick would go viral online and his comment section served as a place for folks to theorycraft in regard to the origin of the wand, and more specifically, the source of the image featured on the demonic witch one. I mean, after all, what or who is this person? The source of this image featured on the evil stick proved to be elusive for some time. But eventually, thanks to thousands of online contributors, its creator was tracked down. The infamous image used on the evil stick was created by an online horror artist going under the alias Butcher Ludwig. Apparently, Ludwig had taken this photo back in 2002 and uploaded it to the internet as a part of a gore-themed pinup girl series. While the woman featured in this image was in fact real and as a photography model, none of the blood or gore present was. It was all just practical effects and post-editing. However, what's curious about this is that there are actually differences in Butcher Ludwig's original sort of, you know, mock-up of this and the one that's used on the evil stick. The image on the evil stick has been edited. You can clearly see this when the two are compared and Butcher Ludwig's watermark has been removed from the evil stick image. Which brings us to the fact that Butcher Ludwig had no idea that his artwork was being used for this bizarre product. Whoever manufactured the evil stick blatantly stole his artwork to use for its creation. Initially under fire from members of the public who felt that he was somehow responsible for the creation of the toy, Butcher Ludwig would explain to the internet masses that he had nothing to do with the art's inclusion in the kid's toy, and that the art was indeed stolen from him. Which of course brings us to the final stage of the evil stick mystery. 
Who or what company is responsible for stealing this man's art and making this messed up toy? Journalist Matt Clark's YouTube viewers managed to connect the product's origin as being from China thanks to metadata found within the Evil Sticks barcode. But unfortunately, none have been able to specifically name the manufacturer responsible for the Evil Sticks production. Both Matt Clark and Butcher Ludwig have claimed to have communicated with factories associated with the item's production, but no company name has ever been publicly revealed. There still exists this strange air of mystery surrounding the Evil Stick, which has led many to create conspiracy theories suggesting that the Evil Stick is something like a real-world version of an Elsagate video. You know, some creeps out there producing content or products that seem child-friendly but contain serious adult themes inside. Considering the apparent Chinese bootleg origins of this product, many have postulated potential explanations for the true intentions behind the creation of the Evil Stick toy. It's thought that the Evil Stick itself functioned in a way like a game of chance, with there being bad and good Evil Sticks that one could collect. After all, some Evil Sticks were have said to have featured pleasant imagery with music and whimsical sound effects, and only one, the demonic Evil Stick, featured an evil cackling laugh that would traumatize kids. This, the demonic girl one, naturally would have been like the worst evil stick that you could pull and it laughing at you and being creepy was like the manufacturer's way of like giving the middle finger to the person who bought it saying that they sucked, I guess. I like to think of it as accidentally picking the Bowser flower and Peach's birthday cake in Mario Party 1, you know what I'm saying? Basically, it seems like the evil stick is just some up Chinese toy where the implications of traumatizing kids in the way of telling them that they got a bad pull kind of got lost in translation, at least culturally, perhaps? In the wake of the Evil Stick controversy, the product disappeared from store shelves around America, and as far as I'm aware, the Evil Stick is no longer sold in this country. Several Evil Sticks have appeared on eBay over the years and have sold for hundreds of dollars, with the Demon Stick in particular being quite rare. In a story that began as a mysterious online conspiracy and seems to have ended in a classic tale of Chinese bootlegging, that was the evil stick story. I'd be willing to bet most of you watching are familiar with the Baby Shark song on YouTube. Baby. No, God, please, no! This viral children's jingle hit the internet in 2016 and went massively viral and has since racked up billions of views and is still stuck in yours and my head and will be forever in all eternity. And with the popularity of Baby Shark on YouTube, the brand has essentially become an empire with millions of dollars being generated off of Baby Shark every year thanks to this earworm of a song. Its popularity has generated a Nickelodeon cartoon series, branded grocery products, and of course, lots of toys. Sadly though, Baby Shark has somewhat of a dodgy reputation when it comes to its branded merchandise. Such is the case of a particularly dangerous Baby Shark toy. It all begins with a Baby Shark bath toy that hid shelves in May of 2019. This seemingly innocuous baby shark was sold at Target, Walgreens, Ross, and Walmart. The shark was made of a hard plastic material and included a feature where the shark would sing and swim along the top of water when placed in a bathtub or swimming pool. While many such bath toys have been on the market for decades now, the baby shark toy featured an insidious design flaw that was a big danger for kids. What images of this product do not properly convey is the sheer size of the shark. The toy itself is actually seven inches long from nose to tail. So in the context of a child, that's a pretty large toy, which of course brings us to the rather sharp point on this toy, that being the shark's fin. Since the release of this baby shark bath toy, this sharp hard plastic dagger-like fin has reportedly resulted in 12 child injuries, including lacerations and puncture wounds. The injuries resulting from children slipping and falling on the toy's rigid fin. Many of these injuries have reportedly sent kids to the hospital and required stitches. As a result of these reports, in 2023, the 
7.5 million large baby shark water toys in circulation were recalled by their manufacturer, Zuru LLC. Consumers were told to immediately stop using the dangerous sharks and to contact Zuru for a full refund of $14 for each. The recall stated the following, quote, consumers should disable the tail fin by cutting it on the full-size bath toy or by bending it on the mini-size bath toy, mark the body of the shark bath toy with the word recalled and the unique code provided during registration for the recall. Then upload a photo of the product showing it's disabled and marked at recallrtr.com slash bath shark. Upon receipt of the photo, Zuru will issue a refund to purchasers. This recall is still somewhat recent and is an actively developing story. I'm unaware of any civil lawsuits resulting from injuries. Whatever the case, this situation is a dark stain on the reputation of one of the most beloved children franchises to rise to prominence in recent memory. This next story was a toy recall that occurred in the early days of the internet when information didn't spread as fast as it does these days. It's one of the most disturbing and widespread recalls of all time, involving two franchises beloved by Americans. It's the story of Burger King's deadly Pokeballs. In 1999, during the promotion for the first Pokemon movie, Burger King held a $22 million promotion for the movie, releasing a set of 57 miniature Pokemon Pokemon toys which were contained within small Pokeballs measuring 3 inches in diameter. Burger King distributed the toys through their Big Kids Meal and Regular Kids Meals, and the promotion was set to last through November and December of 1999. These Pokeballs were manufactured by Equity Marketing Inc. in Los Angeles, California, and could be opened by pulling the two halves of the Pokeballs apart, revealing the Pokemon toy inside. Now for you true 90s kids out there, you most definitely remember this promotion motion. It was a massive deal and I remember having multiple of these toys, you know, as a kid. It's a fucking miracle that I'm still alive, uh, considering what I'm about to detail to you all. Yes, in 99, the Pokemon craze was at its height and this toy run was a massive hit for Burger King. Restaurants were wrapped with customers attempting to get their hands on Pokeballs and unsurprisingly shortages occurred. These BK Pokeballs were such a fixture of public interest at the time that the Burger King president of North America even went as far as running newspaper advertisements apologizing to the public when there were shortages. However, what we'll soon find is that shortages would be the least of Burger King's problems as an insidious design flaw within the Pokeball itself would begin to reveal itself. A design flaw with lethal consequences, might I add. On December 11th of 1999, it was being reported that a 13-month-old girl in Sonora, California was found unresponsive in her playpen by family members. When she was turned over, the family discovered that the girl had a Pokeball suctioned to her face, one side covering her mouth and the other her nose. The Pokeball had suctioned to the toddler's mouth and she had suffocated to death. After this tragedy was revealed to the public, the local sheriff's department issued a warning about the Burger King Pokeballs, citing the toy as the cause of the infant's tragic passing. It was noted that the small diameter and concave structure of the Pokeball made it particularly susceptible to suctioning. A teething baby could chew on the toy, manipulating it in a way where an airtight seal would be made, posing major suffocation risk. This was the first time in history a Burger King toy had been associated with the death of a child, but the burger giant would initially attempt to shirk responsibility regarding the matter, claiming that there wasn't enough conclusive evidence to prove that their toy was the direct cause of the child's death, and that the kid's passing could have possibly been due to completely unrelated factors. Despite the ball being found on her mouth, but uh, okay. They said this, but then it happened again. On December 23rd of 1999, two days before Christmas, a girl from Kansas reportedly got half of a Pokeball stuck on her nose and mouth and nearly suffocated in her own home. Thankfully, the girl's parents managed to remove the suction seal before she was killed. She would receive treatment and suffered no serious injuries. This second incident was reported by news media and raised eyebrows among the public. They couldn't ignore the Pokeball flaw any longer. This second incident left Burger King with no 
other option than to act. Public pressure was mounting and consumer panic along with it. So with this in consideration, Burger King Pokeballs would cease distribution immediately and a recall would be issued. And by Christmas Eve of 1999, all Burger King toys were removed from stores. Several days later, on December 29th of 1999, a nationwide recall was issued. Along with this recall came several ominous warnings released to the public by Burger King that were on both print and television. Burger King issued a statement to parents urging them to immediately take away all Pokeball containers from children ages three and younger. The most disturbing thing to come out of the recall outside of the death and injuries themselves was a $1 million TV ad campaign which ominously urged parents to return the deadly children's toys. Burger King and the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission want you to know about the voluntary recall of this Pokemon Pokeball. The ball may pose a suffocation hazard to children under three. Throw the ball away or return it to Burger King. The safety of your child is of the utmost importance to us. And while these creepy television ads were certainly effective at getting attention of the public and urging them to recall the Pokeballs, Sadly, deaths were still occurring as Pokeballs were out in circulation still. While the recall campaign was ongoing, a four-month-old boy in Indianapolis, Indiana would fall victim to one of the deadly balls, the Pokeball suctioning to his face, causing the child to suffocate in his crib. And in true macabre fashion, the more deaths occurred, the faster the word spread about the recall. And eventually enough death would occur that awareness would be high enough that most parents were finally privy to the fact that these Pokemon toys were dangerous. Parents would begin destroying them en masse and eventually this crisis would come to an end. In the wake of this Pokeball crisis, Burger King received heavy criticism for their initial reluctance to initiate a recall of their toy. Equity Marketing, the company that made the toys, rebutted critics stating that before launching the toys, they ensured that the Pokeball containers met or exceeded federal safety guidelines and underwent an exuberant amount of safety testing by an independent third-party lab before, during, and after production of the balls. They said that they checked all the federal safety guideline boxes in the process of making the Pokeball product. However, the issue was that while the toy had passed all the regulatory child choke tests, these parameters did not assess the risk for suction, which was the way that the Pokeballs killed. The toy's design flaw was a blind spot for both Burger King and the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And in part because of this high profile case, toys nowadays are tested for suctioning risks. As far as compensation for victims, the parents of the 13 month old girl that passed from the Burger King Pokeballs would file suit against the company and would win a monetary settlement from the corporation. The exact dollar amount awarded has been kept confidential. It's not known if any other victims' families won in legal action against the company, but it goes without saying they deserve something for what these Pokeballs put them through. And what's likely one of the darkest children's toy recalls in American history, those were the deadly Burger King Pokeballs. While I wouldn't necessarily consider a ring camera a children's toy, parents do use ring devices to monitor and protect their children. Take for example ring cameras in a kid's room or baby monitors produced by the company. But what happens when products that you use to safeguard your kids end up traumatizing them? This next chapter involves several nightmarish examples of nefarious hackers who have infiltrated ring cameras and other security devices to scare kids. Arguably one of the most disturbing examples of this occurred in Tennessee back in 2019. Tennessee woman Ashley LeMay had purchased a set of ring cameras to look after her three daughters. And this system worked well initially, but on the fourth night of the camera's operation, the unimaginable occurred. While Ashley's daughter Alyssa is playing alone in her room, an unknown man's voice begins speaking to the girl from the device, claiming that he's Santa Claus and begins instructing her to start breaking things in the house. Who is that? I'm your best friend. I'm Santa Claus. Mommy! I'm, I'm Santa Claus. Don't you want to be my best friend? You can mess up your room. You can break your TV. 
can do whatever you want. At first, the girl is confused, and when she refuses to follow the instructions of this deranged hacker, the guy begins loudly playing the uncanny, creepy classic hit, Tiny Tim's Tiptoe Through the Tulips Through the Speakers. <laughs> The girl's father would hear this creepy ruckus and rush to the scene, intervening and putting a stop to the harassment. The hacker responsible for this incident is still unknown. A similar incident would occur the same year, involving a 13-year-old being harassed with frequent questions by a hacker who had breached his home's ring security system. Hello? I see you. What? I see you. How you doing? How's your day? Isaac. What's your name? Lamar. What up, Lamar? How's your day? It's good. Do you play Minecraft? Of course, he doesn't play Minecraft. I don't know. Do you play CSGO? While this hacker seemed less malicious and honestly just kind of like started a conversation with this kid, I can't even begin to stress the disturbing implications of, you know, hacking into someone's house and being able to communicate with them. It just, it brings chills to my body, like really. Reports of these Ring hackings would go viral online and in local media. Regarding the hacks, Ring said in a statement in December of 2019, quote, while we're still investigating this issue and are taking appropriate steps to protect protect our devices based on our investigation, we are able to confirm this incident is in no way related to a breach or compromise of Ring security. In 2020, the hackings would escalate even further. During this year, an Atlanta, Georgia family was spied on and swatted by a malicious hacker for seemingly no other reason than to fulfill some sadistic power fantasy. Change all your shit. stop using the same passwords for everything. That's sick. Uh, we That's are sick. Yeah, we are discussing you. This is the 15th one today. We do this all over the United States. The stakes were now higher than ever. I mean, after all, this thing has gone from just messing with kids by playing creepy songs all the way to potentially putting families' lives in danger. Fortunately, though, around this time, it was discovered how these hacks were taking place. And it essentially all boiled down to weak passwords. See, it's not all too uncommon for social media sites and other online services to experience danger data leaks where user information, including login info, finds its way onto the internet. What ring hackers were essentially doing was accessing these data leaks that were associated with different, you know, websites and services and basically, you know, trying to uh, brute force their way into Ring camera systems by using old passwords from other services because a lot of people just use the same password for everything. While a majority of those who committed Ring camera hacks were never identified or criminally punished, a small handful of Ring hackers have been arrested and prosecuted. In 2022, two men, Kaya Christian Nelson of Racine, Washington, and James Thomas Andrew of Charlotte, North Carolina, were charged in a Los Angeles court with one count of conspiracy to intentionally access computers without authorization. Nelson was also charged with two counts of intentionally accessing a computer without authorization and two counts of aggravated identity theft for hacking various home camera systems. Nelson allegedly accessed Yahoo email accounts and Ring accounts belonging to victims all throughout the United States. He would then allegedly call the police and report a crime while watching through his live feed. The guy was swatting people and watching the SWAT live through their own ring cameras. How fucked up is that? Thomas Andrew McCarty is facing nine counts of making a false statement, nine counts of false information and hoax, one count of stalking, and six counts of aggravated identity theft. In February of 2022, Nelson pled guilty to two counts of making terroristic threats, in the second degree and one count of terroristic threatening in the first degree. This man was sentenced to serve seven years in prison. Curiously, since the arrests of these two individuals, ring camera hackings have pretty much stopped. That being said, the threat of ring camera hacking is still out there and the only way to prevent it is to have a strong password and not get wrapped up in leaks. 
extremely popular in the mid 2010s, most of you watching likely remember the hoverboard craze. Admittedly, these things are fun to mess around on and they got so popular that hoverboards kind of became a meme for a while. With every Zoomer kid in America YOLO swagging out on these things, they just got tiresome, you know? While hoverboards are fondly remembered by many, what's often not discussed about this toy is the dark history surrounding it and the many houses burnt down, children injured and killed because of them. Back in the day, people saw hoverboards as a potential futuristic form of transportation. The hypothetical contraption made popular thanks to Marty McFly's hoverboard featured in Back to the Future 2. Decades later, the world is yet to get flying hoverboards for real, the technology still out of reach. But in 2013, manufacturers decided to cash in on the legacy pop culture hype and began selling electronic swivel skateboard-like toys under the name Hoverboard. The genesis of these swivel hoverboard products actually begins with a Kickstarter created by American entrepreneur Steve Chen. This Kickstarter would later result in the creation of his hoverboard product, which sold under the name Hovertracks. For those who don't know, hoverboards move by the user tilting in the direction that they want to go. It's also possible to get the board to spin in a circle by tilting your feet in opposite directions. When hoverboards hit shelves, they were almost an immediate hit. And much of this was in part thanks to how popular social media was at the time and videos of the hoverboard spreading virally. Videos would surface online showcasing various celebrities like Justin Bieber, Jamie Foxx, Kendall Jenner, and more riding hoverboards, and dozens of funny fail videos surfaced as well showing Viners, YouTubers, and everyday people busting their asses and crashing their boards. Much like scooters and bicycles, hoverboards became a hugely popular hit with children. By June of 2015, copycats of the hoverboard began flooding the market, and the quality of these products began to suffer as a result. Now, you might think the danger being posed to the youth in regard to this product was, you know, simply kids crashing and busting their head open on the board. But the real insidious danger with the hoverboard was actually the risk of these things exploding and catching on fire. Many of these fires causing entire homes to be burnt down and lives ruined. With low quality hoverboards now in the hands of consumers, videos began surfacing on the news and social media showcasing hoverboards bursting into flames. One Louisiana family who purchased a hoverboard for their son's Christmas gift unfortunately lost their entire home thanks to the board igniting and setting fire to the property. As more boards were proven faulty, a social media panic began to set in, and online retailers started removing specific hoverboard products from their websites. In late 2015, hoverboards manufactured by the company Swagway were taken off of Amazon completely. It was later determined that the cause of these fires was caused by faulty lithium-ion batteries that were placed in these low-quality contraptions. Because of their poor design, scooters could actually overheat while being charged and just blow up. Businesses started banning people from using hoverboards on their property, and many airlines banned the product from being placed in carry-on or check baggage due to safety issues posed by the batteries. Quote, Delta reviewed hoverboard product specifications and found that manufacturers do not consistently provide detail about the size or power of their lithium ion batteries. Despite the rise in awareness in regard to the dangers posed by hoverboards, unfortunately, these faulty products would continue to hurt and maim children. On January 9th of 2016, at the home of Brian and Megan Fox in Nashville, Tennessee, their child's hoverboard bursted into flames while the parents weren't at home. The two children heard noises coming from the first floor and hid upstairs thinking that the sound was an intruder. However, what they didn't realize was is that that sound was their hoverboard board exploding and they were essentially trapped in a house that was now burning down. Brian and Megan arrived home shortly after to find their house engulfed in flames with their two young children still stuck inside. 
Brian would attempt to rescue his kids and sustain several burn injuries while doing so. Thankfully, the children would be heroically rescued after they jumped out of windows. Both would survive only sustaining minor injuries. This hoverboard-induced fire completely annihilated the family's $1 million home and their belongings, resulting in approximately $2 million in damages. Later in the year, the family would sue Amazon, alleging that the company was liable for the defective hoverboard and the damages that it caused. Amazon argued that they were simply a conduit for the consumer and the manufacturer, and that in all reality, the manufacturer was to blame for the fire. However, eventually in 2020, Amazon would settle with the family for an undisclosed amount of money. With all of this chaos and destruction caused by hoverboards, it wouldn't be long for official agencies to step in and get the ball rolling on a recall here. The Consumer Product Safety Commission would launch an investigation into the safety of hoverboard devices and determine that the lithium-ion batteries within them could overheat and pose the high risk of catching fire. And after these findings, in July of 2016, the commission ordered a recall of over 500,000 hoverboard units from eight different manufacturers. The Swagway X1 hoverboard alone was the target of 267,000 of these recalls. Sadly though, even after the recall, more children were getting hurt. In early 2017, a hoverboard exploded and caught fire and resulted in the death of two children after their entire house was burnt down. In January of 2018, a Clarkston, Michigan family were charging their hoverboard when it bursted into flames. Fortunately, this family was able to escape the deadly discharge and alert the fire department who were able to put out the flames and save their house. Remarkably, in 2021, a Utah-based family was actually able to catch a hoverboard exploding on video. The video shows a young child almost being burnt by the device. Luckily, the kid's father, who was asleep at the time, woke up and grabbed the fire extinguisher and was able to put out the blaze. On April 1st of 2022, in Hellerton, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, a 10-year-old girl and her 15-year-old sister were both killed in a house fire reportedly caused by a hoverboard. And sadly, even after there being problems with these hoverboard products for close to half a decade at this point, defective ones are still making it onto store shelves and hurting kids. Hopefully this trend dies down in the near future, but with hoverboard deaths and injuries within the last year, it's not looking good. In the realm of these fad, flash-in-the-pan toys, the king of all of them is without a doubt the fidget spinner. With their bright colors, collectible nature, and of course seamless spinning function, these fidget spinners proved to be quite the ubiquitous toy found amongst the youth in the late 2010s. Fidget spinners were said to have possessed emotional and mental benefit to kids, helping some children deal with anxiety and stress. While these aforementioned benefits surrounding fidget spinners are up for debate, okay? What's undeniable about this product is that it has a dark side of hurting kids. With reports of fidget spinners causing psychosis, being poisonous, and being used in attempted child kidnappings. Fidget spinner-like products have been available since 1993. Around this time, a woman named Katherine Hedinger developed an early spinning toy prototype with the intent of helping kids deal with emotions by way of distraction. However, this style of fidget toy wouldn't become popular until decades later, starting in 2017. In 2017, an aspiring businessman by the name of Alan Marmon saw potential in the toy if only it could be mass-produced, leading him to create the fidget 360, a product that would become the model for all modern fidget spinners found on shelves today. The Fidget 360 toy was marketed as a way of helping young teens and children cope with autism, ADHD, and anxiety, despite there not being any solid research proving the notion at the time. Whatever the case, fidget spinners are fun and addictive, and it was an immediate hit after being put on store shelves. Much like the hoverboard, the popularity of fidget spinners was thanks in part to social media. Online, one can find numerous videos of folks showcasing their spectacular fidget spinner skills, magic tricks involving the toys, and humorous skits to boot. But in contrast to the hoverboard, fidget spinners were actually relatively affordable, with most of them ranging in price from $5 to $20. So this was like a people's toy, you know what I'm saying? Everybody had one of these things. They were very common among the public. 
But while the internet videos portrayed this kid's toy as harmless fun and games, as Chinese fidget toy copycats flooded the market, problems began to occur. In May of 2017, the reality of fidget spinners being a choking hazard would come to fruition. This happened when a Texas mother named Kelly Rose Joniak had to rush her daughter Britton to the emergency room after she accidentally swallowed part of the gadget. It said that the woman heard her daughter, quote, make an odd retching noise in the back seat. She says, looking back in the mirror, I saw her face turning red and drool pouring from her mouth. She couldn't utter noises, but looked panicked, so I immediately pulled over. After being taken to the hospital and given x-rays, it was discovered that part of the fidget spinner brushing, which is the metal part of the spinner that's about the size of a quarter, had popped out and was lodged into her esophagus. Doctors had to perform emergency surgery on the girl, which required general anesthesia. Thanks to an endoscopic procedure, the brushing was safely extracted from her body. The mother says, fortunately, we had a positive outcome, but it was pretty scary there for a while. From this, I wish to offer some word of caution to parents. Fidget spinners are the current craze, so they're widely distributed. Kids of all ages may be getting them, but not all spinners come with age-appropriate warnings. The brushings pop out easily, so if you have young kids, keep in mind that these present a potential choking hazard. And fidget spinners were not only a choking risk, there were some deranged criminals out there that were using the popularity of the fidget spinner and using the spinners themselves as bait to kidnap children. In June of 2017, a New Jersey man reportedly attempted to lure two children ages 8 and 11 into the back of his vehicle while at a convenience store in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. The man first tried offering the children snacks and candy, but when they didn't show interest, the creep then upped the ante, allegedly offering the young kids fidget spinners to play with if they came with him. Thankfully though, somebody at the convenience store saw what was going on and intervened. The staff member told the guy to leave, and in response, he aggressively said that the kids are coming with me, but after a little bit of back and forth, the creep eventually got out of there. The fidget spinning attempted kidnapper fled away in a white Toyota Corolla. New Jersey's Old Bridge Township Police put out a Facebook status regarding the attempted fidget spinner kidnapping and provided security images and a sketch of the suspect, offering a reward for the fidget freak's capture. However, to this day, the perp still remains at large. Choking and kidnapping bait aside, some fidget spinners were found to contain toxic levels of lead in them. In November of 2017, massive American retailer Target took fidget spinners off of their shelves when it was discovered by a consumer advocacy group that various spinners contained dangerously high levels of lead that lead being found in the metal bearings of the spinners. Quote, new report on high levels of lead, 300 times the limit in some fidget spinners. As a result of this, Target would remove the product. Fortunately though, despite the possibility of lead poisoning, kidnap baiting, and choking hazards, as far as I'm aware, no one has died from a fidget spinner. Let's hope it remains that way. And well, you made it to the end. Those were the internet's most dangerous toys. Let me know what you thought about this video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.